Okay, I think we should start. All right. Um, okay, how many? Uh, let's try to figure out who's here. Um, how many stakeholder, uh, product owner type people are in the room? Web producer types, kind of like client types. Uh, what about um, project managers, developers? Okay, cool. All right. Um, how many people are familiar with the terms agile and waterfall? It's kind of a like everybody, right? Like I should have done this session like two years ago. Now it's kind of it's like over, right? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, how many people in the room are considering going for an agile? Uh, methodology in, in an upcoming project or something. How many people are kind of unsure of that decision or have uh, entered into that decision, we're going to go agile and I feel kind of uneasy about it, not really sure how it's going to go. Okay. How many people in the room are just like, yeah, absolutely agile all the way, every day, all, all the time? All right, I perfect. Yeah. perfect. Um, okay, what else do I want to? How many people have had an agile project go great, wonderfully, like everybody, right? Yeah, you know, it happens, or what about horribly? Nobody's immune, right? It can go anything, yeah, it can go great or terrible. How many agile experts are in the room? Right, okay, humble, a humble man, but good. Go easy on me, this is supposed to be like a 10,000 foot view, you know, of, of a situation that's kind of been happening where uh, consultancies are taking on agile methodologies and kind of to some extent, forcing it upon the clients, or also uh, more clients are getting, you know, they're getting trained at their university in some form or another, and they're coming to consultancies saying, we want to go agile, which is like a dream for consultancies. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to uh, define agile as an inter iterative development process in which getting something like what we wanted um, when we want it and for the available resources is kind of how we're going to define that. And waterfall is a sequential development process where we try to get exactly what we wanted for what we wanted to pay for it when we wanted to get it. Um, I'm uh, with uh, Last Call Media, and uh, we're a Drupal-focused web development shop. We've do, been doing Drupal for a long time. Uh, we've done a, done a lot of things, uh, got a lot of battle scars. Uh, right now, we just do national brands to local retail stores, start to finish graphic design, social media, content strategy, copywriting. Like we, we've got a bunch of people who do a bunch of stuff. Really, our big strength in all of that, the thing that we're really proud of and we're always trying to push forward, is uh, enterprise development workflow and best practices around all that. We really get into uh, the uh, de deployments. I love deployments and I love testing the deployment and just everything tested helps you sleep at night because otherwise that's a major risk. If something's gonna blow up on production, it's gonna come down to me to deal with it and that, that makes me lose sleep. So that's what we like to do. I'm Kelly Albrecht. I'm the CEO of Last Call Media, which just means I've been there the longest. And um, I've been doing Drupal since 2007. Pretty much once I figured out views and CCK, it was just like, all right, this, is, this makes sense. I dropped Joomla like immediately. Um, I'm the lead organizer and presenter at the yearly uh, Drupal camp that we do in Massachusetts in the United States. And so I have a lot of respect for what goes on at these conferences because I can just imagine that effort that it takes to do a camp and then multiply it by 20. And that's what they pull off here. And they do an amazing job. I'm really honored to be up here today as well. Um, so I, I present at those camps, and uh, now I'm at this conference. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a picture of a young me, right? Um, it's almost a former life at this point. Uh, I really enjoyed <coughs> being able to do that. I don't, I don't know if I still can, but um, I put this up here because I do like going fast, I do like taking risks, uh, I like the excitement, but you can't tell from the picture because it's kind of crazy, but I like calculated risks 
I like the, uh, what I loved about this is you can start building small jump jumps and kind of learn the physics of it and get bigger and bigger and bigger and small steps, you know, one small step at a time and you're doing something super fun. Um, but in building those, those jumps, you're kind of straining the order, you're, you're like pushing, pushing the limit and you're kind of right there in the chaos, you know, if you fall, that's kind of chaotic, like the, the, uh, the bike goes everywhere, the dirt goes everywhere, but really there's some order behind that too. Gravity, right? It's like a rule, it's a law, it's always pulling everything down. So you kind of get in the middle of all that thing and you can kind of see when you're walking that line, it's really fun, it's a really fun place to be and um, it's very, it can be very introspective. You can kind of see where things can cross over from order into chaos and you can also see, start to see where things cross over from chaos into order. This is a, also a young picture of me, right? I stopped combing my hair for, and for about six months I had a head full of chaos, right? But then this really cool thing started happening. You know, I was young studying politics and I was just kind of experimenting and stuff and I just thought this would be great. This really cool thing started happening where like the strands like ordered themselves and it was, it was just a really neat thing to have happen. It, I don't know, I think, the dre I think dreadlocks are really cool. Everybody may not agree, but... Um, Order does kind of find its way into things. Um, I've grown up a bit since then. I've cut my hair. Um, I've become absorbed in my family and my work. Um, I still enjoy things like roller coasters and the beach and hiking and rock climbing. Here's a cool picture of me um, on the edge of a cliff, you know, kind of just having some fun and excitement, taking some risks, doing a little bit more. Um, and I'm not introducing myself in this way because I want you to think that I'm cool. Maybe just a little bit, but you know that can't really be helped, right? But I want you to know that not only who's up here today, because you have to introduce, introduce yourself somehow, but I want you to know that I'm not averse to risk. I'm not obsessive about planning. I'm not, like, you know, I don't over plan. I have trouble planning in just a general way. We know we all struggle with some things, but, um, so that's a struggle I think for everybody, right? With a, you know, let's, let's plan, let's get the specs done. Um, so I don't have a bias towards over preparedness or preparedness. I don't make lists. I don't make lists of the lists I need to make. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. The people that do that are amazing and we need them. We need them to, we need them to write the <coughs> specs and everything. Um, but I think at each one of our cores, there's uh, a little bit of that dreadlock Kelly that we saw a few slides ago. Like, let's just go, let's, it's gonna be fine. It's, the order is gonna happen. You know, th it feels like chaos right now, but we're just gonna get to work and we're just gonna get it done, and something great is gonna happen. Uh, so any order that you see here for me personally, and probably for a lot of us, kind of fell into place as we were growing between the order and the chaos in our lives. It kind of, a lot of times it just falls into place. It's really hard to force it in there, so a lot of it happens by happenstance, basically. Um, so, at the time of this picture, I was still dreadlock Kelly a little bit, but I had started to become eyeglasses Kelly, right? So in this picture, um, I've got on this shirt of this computer company that I started a, a long time ago. And um, computer repair shop. And I just kind of went at it. This is, the, um, this is the empty shell of a space that I rented. And I kind of knew where I wanted to go. I kind of knew what the e end deliverable was going to be. Bought some flooring over there. Um, Oh, and I, I knew where I wanted to go, but I had limited resources also. And so I started building it, just went at it, added things if, uh, you know, if I needed to change a requirement along the way, I just did so. I just kept chipping away at it. Um, here's some more pictures, you know, the electrical got put in, got in some lights up there. I've got an air compressor I borrowed from my dad. Um, just kind of, you know, I didn't really have any specs. And a lot of times when I think back to this time in my life, I think, man, if I had specced this whole thing out, if I had planned all the pieces that it was gonna take to get this thing off the ground, I wouldn't have done it. Sometimes you only can get things done by just getting to it and getting to work and you know, change, being allowed to change the requirements. I've got some paint up on the walls there, some, some uh, retail grid wall, which is surprisingly hard to find. You know, buying, buying things to sell things is not like a typical thing that people do. And so here it is, here's my launch ready product. Uh, product. Um, it launched like this, about when I wanted it to launch. 
Um, there's still some things about it that I just had to live with. Um, like, I never really liked the, this paint color. I think you can agree, right? It's like, a, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like a brick. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I wasn't going to buy new paint and I wasn't going to paint it again. Just said, oh, well, all right, this is this iteration. The store doesn't look anything like this now. We've, you know, we've redone different things, moved things around. It looks amazing now. Um, but really, this worked really well for me. Um, and I think mostly why this worked really well is because I was the product owner, I was the project manager, I was the developer, I was the QA, I was the judge, jury, executioner, I was the dictator on this project, and it's really easy to get along with yourself, right? So that base was covered, my team was me, and that, and that really worked out. Um, and even with my short hair and glasses at this time, I was still mostly Dreadlock Kelly, just getting the job done. Um, so the business evolved and grew, and it's got a couple of locations, and you can't really see inside on the left-hand picture there, but it looks great, and this is another location. Um, and uh, things have changed quite a bit. Um, well, I'm actually, I'm not really involved in it anymore, and uh, I'm definitely not allowed to pick up a hammer anymore. When, um, when they want to do something, it goes quite a bit differently. There are uh, specs and requirements and statements of work, and we get bids from the contractors. And um, this works really well. This is a, like invaluable for them because they need to know exactly what they're getting from who and when and what it's going to cost, and it needs to go exactly when it's going to start, you know, and because they put a budget on it and they say this is what we're going to do, you know. So like, I think eyeglasses Kelly would be proud that this much effort goes into these things. This is a picture of an office space that uh, Last Call Media is working on moving into, and we have to do a lot of construction, and we've got to ha we have a budget for it, and we need to know, we don't want just something like what we wanted. We want, we're gonna hire somebody, and we're gonna get, and you know, getting lots of specs, it's all getting planned out, it's gonna go a certain way, and we're gonna get this. This is what's gonna happen. Um, in contrast, projects that are done internally go quite a bit differently. Who here works at a place where projects get done internally? By your own resources, for your own resources, right? Probably, you know, I mean, some of you may, and, and it's great if you do, but you probably don't prioritize spec writing and, and, and a lot of like planning of the deliverables, and this is exactly what's gonna happen and how it's gonna go. Right, so as software developers, we, we prefer the agile methodology, right? So let's, uh, let's take a look at this, right? group of software development methods, iterative and incremental development, requirements and solutions evolve through collaboration between self-organizing cross-functional teams, adaptive planning, evolutionary development, time boxed. This sounds awesome, right? This sounds amazing. This sounds like everything that we want to do to get the job done and none of what we don't want to deal with. Just, I don't like doing that. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to waste my time on it. I'm gonna just going to, I'm just going to get to work. Um, so almost intuitively, we know this can be more efficient. This is a lot like, sounds a lot like when I was building that computer store. And, the, and even afterwards, when, when it wasn't just me as the sole developer, uh, designer, dictator of the whole thing, even it was just a few of us. We had a limited amount of money, and we wanted to do a certain thing, and we just did what we had to to get it done. Right, so agile is delivery driven, and back to at the beginning, I'm, I'm gonna I'm defining it as something like what we want delivered delivered when we want it and within budget, right? And this is really like I don't know, it's not really the case anymore. But I remember several years ago, everything was beta, right? Because it was just we're just getting this to market, use it, let us know, we'll fix it on the next release. There's some you know there's some weird brick colored wall. We didn't like the paint color, but we didn't have time, so just you know, just try it out. It's still going to work, and you know, the beta thing. Everybody's kind of used to it, but that's kind of a, it was kind of a sign where people were just delivering things, getting things done, getting them out. And I think it still continues to this day, except the beta term has kind of faded away a little bit. But it makes sense where if you're on an internal, internal project doing a project for yourself, you've already hired everybody. You've already done done your due dil diligence on interviewing, you know the, this is the best team you can get. So why do you need to spend all this time with scopes and statements of work and, and spec writing? 
when you've already got, you, you're, not, you're not putting them on the hook for delivering this certain thing necessarily in this certain way. You've hired them, they're just, if they hit a snag, they're the best team you've got. Just work around the snag. So, so it's really, it really works well on an internal basis. And one of the things that is happening is um, consultancies are either pushing for or being approached by clients that want to do an agile project. But an agile project does have its pitfalls too. Like at the beginning I asked, has anybody had an agile project go horribly? It definitely can happen. It can go terrible. An agile project requires an extremely solid relationship between everyone, the whole team. And when you, when this is, this is a solvable problem when you're internal and your team is your team and your product owner is on your team and you can do more training and get to know each other and you, you can build a trusting, solid relationship with each other. But when it's a new client, you don't know, you, you don't have that solid relationship. If it just happens and that's just magic, but good partnerships take work. So imagine a scenario, right? And this may have happened to some of you where so many different directions evolve mid-project, right? Here's the scope change that we're all, we've all committed to being agile to adapt to and no problem, right? And gridlock develops. Somebody wants to go a different way, it's just before QA, this isn't gonna be good, the, the, but you're agile, right? You, so you can do this. I've, I've now got a license to change scope as much as I want because you're agile. And gridlock happens. And you're spending more time being agile, dealing with these changing requirements, and time runs out, right? And what gets delivered on time, right? Because it's time boxed and within budget because it's, you know, it's fixed bid in this way. Leaves much to be desired. I don't know if you can see that. It's really small. It says leaves much to be desired. And what that's, you know, you can't read it because you barely got anything because you spent all of your time as a poor team being agile. So it happens, totally happens. That was cool, right? I like did this arrow thing because I'm, I'm working on being a good presenter. Um, who's had something like this happen to them on one of their projects? Two, three, be honest, right? You're agile, right? I'll just keep changing my mind. And you gotta deliver something that I like. Um, Okay, so, right, look, all right, so I didn't see that many hands, but what about these scenarios? Like somehow you, you found yourself on an agile project with 20 decision makers. Now everybody's got to say, right? Universities and large corporations are great at this. You think you've got the, 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 the stakeholder, but then they bring in their stakeholder, you know, right during QA. Or um, one stubborn pixel pusher, Right, like I want it to match the PSDs. Does not match PSDs, like right to the pixel. Or uh, one time when, um, when it, very early in my career, I had a client that didn't want to use Photoshop, but she was very particular about where things were on the page. And I allowed her to talk me into sit down sessions. This was a long time ago. Now I don't do this anymore. Where move it a little to the left. A little more to the left. One more. Perfect. Oh, I couldn't move it, but okay. It's, <laughs> it's great. And then, you know, so the part of the agreement of going into this is like, well, I've got a bill for my time. And then, you know, after you know, weeks of pixel pushing, the, the, the budget was kind of blown and, and she wasn't completely happy, but we worked it out. But that happens. Or scenarios where, um, let's see. Uh, you know, someone's on the project and they just won't, they're thinkers, right? They won't stop brainstorming about better ways to brainstorm. Like, let's talk about this. This, this project, this process could work better, right? You're trying to be the builder and the improver and the producer and one key player in the whole entire thing is you know, coming up with ideas all along the way. It's like, just put a freeze on this because we need to deliver something. It, get, it's, it can be really hard. Um, or you know, trying to switch gears just before QA totally happens. I've got a new idea, super critical. It's got to go into this release. You guys can do it. Said nearly every project ever. It happens, right? It takes an extremely solid team to effectively navigate these potential pitfalls. 
somebody wants me to sit down with them and push pixels, I now have years of learning on how to appropriately handle that request. When we start a project with a client, we refer to it as an engagement. No matter your chosen dev process, this is pretty serious. This is a big project that could be a lot of money to them. They're going to take it very seriously. We need to work together, and it's a commitment on everyone's part, the client's part too. Here's a very stock picture of a very stock engagement. I don't think they all go like this anymore, but this is a ring on the finger. Um, so a project kickoff, it, it is an engagement. You are a team now, a partnership with a major goal in common. Till site launch do you part, unless you do post-launch support and then you renew your vows or something. Um, so either way, you're going to get gray hairs where you're going, or a few enough gray hairs that you'll pretend they're not really there. Um, upfront, open, honest communication is key to these relationships, especially if you're going into an agile project. You've got to be a team, but also if it's waterfall too, they've got to respect that it's fixed bid and not push scope. They've, that's their commitment. And so you've got to hold them to that. In either process, this is a commitment. This is serious. This involves uh, having each other as, as a priority in the team. The most successful partnerships will know where, they were, where they're going and how they will get there, right? So a lot of times, engagements end up leading to a bad place because there wasn't a lot of communication with them. So you may recognize this type of picture, right? This is the process we all know and love. This is our old ball and chain, if you will. It's got uh, the typical sequential um, development process. We're going to do our requirements and our analysis. Then when that's all set, we're going to design it. The, another term you may hear a lot of times, throw it over the wall, hit coding. You do your stuff, coding's all set. Testing, launch, maintenance, easy peasy, very understandable. All order, no chaos. Wonderful, right? It, but it's become notorious for being inefficient because if this is like a year-long process and you're trying to get all this stuff done up here, you're doing a lot of guesswork and a lot of padding and it's really irritating to spend all that time on that. And you're, you're putting, your, as, as a CEO of a company, on this process, I'm going to be expected to sign my name at some point. Like, this is what's going to happen, I promise. And that can be frustrating. That can be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to do this stuff, right? It can be time consuming and, and inaccurate. Um, every step of the way needs to be planned perfectly so that this container is the right size for the stuff that happened in these two containers so that it fits and it needs to be at the right angle so that it flows down and everything needs to happen at the right time so that when you get to here, it's on time and with budget, just like you signed for. And another thing that happens in this thing is you end up getting really adversarial with your client, right? Because you've got to protect this. Because they're having ideas all the time. And, right? And anything that changes mid-project, you have to consider a change to scope. Hold on, right? So here's Lucy. She's got a new idea. This new idea could potentially blow the whole project to pieces. And you need to find that out. You can't just say, OK, because they're not going to care that you were so accommodating mid-project when there are things off the rails on launch day. You've got to backtrack. You've got to go right back to that whole waterfall thing and make sure, can we fit this idea in? How does this change everything? The whole development structure could need to be restructured to avoid catastrophe, right? Surprise, scope change. Right, here's Lucy. She thought it would be a critical good idea for the footballs to be on shoulders right on launch. Who here has had something like this happen to them, right? It ha you just want to like strangle somebody. How can we prevent this? We need to prevent this is, right? And this happens in Agile too, because you're Agile. You can just, you know, you can just kick it off the shoulder at the last second. No problem. But, all right. So this is the incumbent process. This is where we're coming from. I think we, we all know it. We can all be good at it. We can. I propose, and we'll go keep going after this proposal, that we honor and value its strengths, at least, right? Especially for the clients that desire or require this. 
it can feel really chaotic being a client and going into an agile project where you don't have that trust and you're on the hook to your stakeholders for something really big. All you've got is your budget and it's really hard to just hand that over and don't worry boss, we're gonna get something like what we want. But they, they'll, they'll spend all of our money, the, the money that we've given, so it's you know, within budget and we'll get something like that on time. So when you, when you plan all this out, when you do all this planning, when they need you to do it, it's really valuable to them. And, and clients are worth it, they're your clients. Or you, if they're not worth it, then get clients that are worth it. Um, right, so there can be a lot of unknowns and it can feel really chaotic if you're not planning everything out. So go back, you know, if you go back an analogy, think, you know, prenup. These are oftentimes seen as good ideas in hindsight. Or, you know, maybe just some really good solid upfront communication before engaging. Okay. Here's a little data, because data is cool. Um, this is an agile process and a waterfall process. And this is basically, I'll, I'll do a, another slide, but this is the estimate. And this is like, oh, well, we'll get something like what you want. And then here's what tends to happen anyway. You know, you get this huge ballpark. From all the ideas you're giving me, it could be somewhere in here. And it tends to just balloon out. And the waterfall process is basically, you win some, you lose some. And we track all our projects and our time spent. And when you average them all out, this is, this is kind of how it goes. And I do also want a small tangent from a business perspective from the CEO's chair. The difference between these two processes for us on a business standpoint as a consultancy being asked to do these is, Change your mind all you want, we'll, we're billing hourly, we'll get those extra features in an additional sprint. The waterfall process, we just signed that we're gonna do this for this amount of money. So we're gonna, we gotta protect scope. So the green is the estimate, and the blue is design development, project management, QA. And as, uh, as you get into the process and it starts working and clients see what they can do, and they, they realize that, that you're agile and you can change your mind, things grow, right? And, and it tends to cost about what I ballparked at the beginning when I heard the, the spew of initial ideas. Um, but basically, the thing about agile that is required here for this to not be a horrible experience is while you're going from here to up to the top up there, you need a lot of communication and you need the client on your team in the trenches with you so that they know that as this thing was ballooning, it wasn't happening while you were just playing Xbox. They were there. In like a ticket tracker is, is preferable, so they're making the request, they're seeing the back and forth. You need a lot of transparency. And here's uh, the uh, waterfall one, fixed bid, kind of a estimation by third, you know, by thirds we're gonna get this thing. Here they, they, they uh, creeped us for some scope change and we accommodated. And you, and you win some and you lose some, right? That's just kind of how it goes. And the client gets what they're, what's promised and there's a motivation on your part to be really efficient because you've got to win some. You know, they, they got us on the scope, we accommodated, we've lost the last five in a row. This one's gonna be super easy. We gotta do this right. We gotta get this done. This is the one where we're gonna make up for all the past stuff. So, so, you, so you're, you're, uh, you're motivated to be efficient. So let's look at some efficiency stuff, right? This is a burn down chart. Who here knows what this is? Don't get me wrong, I, I, love, I love this thing. I love it, right? So you know what it is, your, your hours and your tasks are, are, your hours are going down, your tasks are getting completed. And um, when comparing efficiency, insofar as, mo as what can happen in, with agile methods, with scrums and stand-ups and product owners and scrum masters and burn down charts and backlog refinement. There's even scrum of scrums, right? You add in all this stuff, you're adding order to, to this chaos of let's just get things done and, and maybe it'll work out. You're adding this methodology and that can be a really good thing. But it can also, you know, it can also be a bad thing when you have a whole team of people making and analyzing productivity reports where a lot of the times what happens is the devs get good at gaming the system. And this is a real quote from every developer I've ever talked to about this chart. I've heard this called a burn up chart. 
I've heard this called, uh, I'm going to burn this chart down, where basically it's like, well, I've hardly done anything, but my charts look amazing, right? So Agile can suffer from inefficiencies, too. And one really starts to wonder when comparing efficiencies between waterfall and agile. It's sort of like who's more efficient at eating treats, right? This guy, Cookie Monster, or my daughter. One's mess is on the face and the other's mess is on the floor. We really, when we're comparing these two methodologies, we really need to be careful that we're not comparing the worst case scenario of one with the best case scenario of the other. And I'm going to steal this heartwarming moment right here to give a little insight to one of the main takeaways from this presentation, and that is that people do projects, not processes. People over process. We need to value the team, and when, the, when it's a consultancy and the client's coming in, they're part of the team, and we need to, we need to care about that. We can't just agile all the way, all the time. We're not going to waste time on specs. They might really need the specs. So, but Agile is taking over, I think for really good reason. I think that it really fits in with how we like to develop and how we like to get work done. And there's been a few reasons for its takeover. It's now an ongoing business need, software modification is. So you hire the best team you can get and they just get to work. And so in, like, it's like internally at my business, we're gonna do something. I don't want people wasting a bunch of time covering their bases because on the deliverables, just start working. I interviewed you, I love you, you're great. Just start doing the job. Um, and clients, when you have clients, who here has some awesome clients? You guys work great, they trust you with everything. They know if something got harder, that's just because it got harder, right? That's an awesome place to be. And when you have that relationship, you can do more of an agile thing. You don't need to waste time covering your bases uh, promising deliverables that may turn out to be irrelevant down the road. But getting into an agile process, methodology, it needs to be done right and for the right reasons. So how do you choose? How do you make sure that you're not getting into the wrong process or you're, you're going too far with the spec writing or too far with the, with the trust and, and agile methods? So I've got, I've got a... Uh, a way, a way to uh, decide. The way, that I, the way that I think about this is I feel like waterfall is the safe choice because you're documenting everything out, you're, you're taking the time, you're doing the diligence, and things are gonna, you're planning. More planning, better, the better, right? M planning is safety, okay? So I've got some uh, criteria because really if you wanna do an agile, pro agile project, your team has to prove itself, right? So good, efficient partnerships take work. It doesn't just happen. So you've got you've to uh, prove that you can get to the agile carrot thing that's in this. Does everybody recognize this? Right? Mario. Sorry, it's stuck in my head. Um, OK, so but basically, you want to get here, because this is how to work. So you've got to prove yourself, right? If you're a client and you want to go agile, you've got to be available and capable of full ongoing participation because you're part of the team. You've got to get in the trenches. You must have complete trust in your dev team. If something takes a little longer, don't accuse them of playing Xbox. And if you can't trust them, you might want to get stuff specced out in a statement of work. And you've got to be flexible in the subtasks. Because are, we are going to get something like what we want. And the better team that we are, the more like what we wanted we'll get. Right? So a lot of times a client will fail in one of these scenarios. And if you dive into an agile project where they're failing on one of these points, I think you're asking for disaster. So we have, you know, we've, we've had projects where they wanted, uh, they had a big site they wanted done, but the one thing that they had was they had it all, the whole process was on paper, and they just wanted to make that digital. So the spec was, it was really clear, and they had really good specs, and the one place where they failed on this part 
was they were not available and capable of full ongoing participation. They all had full-time jobs. And they just needed to hire someone to do this. And they had a lot of bids on this, and it's really popular in our area. We only work agile, right? And we won the bid because we understood that they had all the specs, and we read through the specs. It was clear to the developers, and it was very easy to say, we're going to do these things in this time frame for this amount of money, and I signed on. And they went waterfall, and we won that project against the other, the other companies. So for a development team to go agile, right, not that many requirements. You just have to be highly skilled, readily available, extremely dependable individual. You just need to have a rock solid team of rock stars. And a lot of us do. And they all want to work agile. And also, a lesser known one, I don't know where, I, I don't know if I got this in research or if I just thought of this one, but really the team members need to be able to maintain their availability throughout the life of the project, right? Because you're not doing all that spec writing beforehand. It's happening during the project if you're lucky. There's, everything's moving so quickly, things are changing. A lot of the institutional knowledge of the project that's developing as you're doing it is in the heads of a lot of people. So y they can't just be coming and going. Right, so, and I think that's the most common factor uh, for not doing an agile project is if for some reason you're not going to be able to keep the same people on it throughout the project. And a lot of times uh, when we're all booked out on agile projects, we'll entertain a more waterfall project that we can, that we, if, it has, if it's got clearly defined specs, a comfortable timeline, and we can just have people chip away at it in their downtime. Because people can jump in and, and figure it out. It's all well documented. And it's not changing under their feet. So projects are best looked at from the other direction. I think that a project has to prove that it can be a waterfall project. So there are some requirements for a project to be a waterfall project. Does everybody know who these two are? Anybody? No? No? Hands? It, here? All right. Go. One guy in the back. This is uh, TLC. TLC, yes. This is from when I was, you know. Hum? Oh, yeah, right? Right? Um, I think this is, I think TLC stands for the group members. So it's got T Boz, Left Eye, and Chili. Chili wasn't available for this, for this picture. <laughs> but um, there they are. Okay, so for a project to go agile, the requirements need to be extensively detailed and clearly defined. They have to be. If you're getting into a project on a waterfall process, if you're, if you're signing your name to getting this done but it's not clear what's gonna get delivered, you're asking for disaster, I think. And the tasks and the steps uh, to complete them need to be outlined and fully understood going into it. Because basically you're saying like this whole thing that's gonna happen, this whole waterfall construction that we're gonna do, it needs to be understood going into the process because you're, you're making this promise. So if a project fails these, it just has to be agile. A lot of times a client will come and, well, how much would it cost to do this vague idea? And well, we need more information than that. I don't know, maybe this should be an agile project. And we've had situations where a client was looking for work and the, s the job was so big and that they didn't have the resources to build the statement of work, but they knew they just had to get started. And they were asking us you know, to come up with a, a fixed price for this, and we, couldn't, we wouldn't do it, because you just can't do that. That's, you can't go down that road. And we've been running an awesome Agile project for them ever since. And we lucked out on the teamwork part. They're, they're a pretty good team. but. But yeah, so a lot of times projects can fail the requirements of going waterfall, and you just you're, you're gonna you're heading for disaster if you sign for that. Okay, so the this picture is from the song "Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls," right? Don't go chasing waterfalls. S stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. I don't think they were talking about agile software development, <laughs> but I think this is relevant because the rivers and the lakes that you're used to, instinctively agile. 
right? Just let's just be agile. Let's add order to that chaos. Or else you've got to chase. If you're going to go waterfall, it's a it's a requirement of the project that you chase it down. You build those specs because your client is worth it in that scenario. All right. So this is uh, this is Batman, and he's selling an agile method, right? We're going to get all the things done. It's going to be awesome. We're going to do none of what we don't want to do, and we're only going to do what we want to do, and we're going to get what we want. It's going to be great, right? Agile needs to be done for all the right reasons. Slow down, keep a level head. The client is your priority. Make sure that there's a commitment from their side as well. If you sell Agile too hard, your client, the, your client or potential client is going to get the wrong idea, and this is what they're going to hear. We will walk through fire for you. Change your scope all you want. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. We're agile. You need to set proper expectations. So I've got this poem here. This is one of my favorite poets. This is a, a poem where to, wa and to walk across the floor to an old dresser with a cracked mirror, see myself ugly, grinning at it all. This is, this is getting something like what we want and being proud of it, and working hard, grinning at it all, right? People over process. The health of the team, when it's a client and you, you're each other's priority, and the health of that team is the priority, followed by the tasks at hand. You need to work together, no matter your chosen dev process. You're partnering on something very serious. It will be great at times, it will be really hard at others. Good, efficient partnerships take work. They don't just happen. Waterfall ones, and especially agile ones, your team, the clients you're team with, your consultant, and you're getting approached by clients that want to go agile, they need to make the commitment. They need the proper expectations. They need to be in the trenches with you. You need to share the responsibility of the project. You need to have commitment from everyone involved. Um, Communication early and often to set honest, realis realistic expectations are critical. You need to have confidence and humility. You need to know how to be have a partnership, and it's really important to value each other. You need to determine what process is best for you as the team going into it. You need to determine it together, commit to it together, and then walk through fire together. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Taco from Gogorin of the Netherlands. Um, thank you very much for your story. Um, I think it really went into the essence of, of how we want to work and how we want to build these relationships with our team. Um, my issue is, can you go back to the slide where you compare the agile data with the uh, uh, waterfall data? Oh, the loose averaging of averages? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because um, that for me, it's a it's it's fundamental. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. here we go. Yeah. For me, this is a fundamental thing because on the right side you say, well, sometimes you win. Yep. And sometimes you lose, right? Right. We've seen this. We've had projects where we're like, wow, absolutely. Okay, got nice margin. I'm I'm also the, the founder of my company, so you know we look at the margin, and then we have this thing going up which means like, okay, we put in more hours than we budgeted and we're losing money. And, and sometimes we lose a lot of money. Right. And especially when you're a small company and you don't have the buffer um, where, you, where you do like two or three wrong estimations, uh, this can really hurt and Absolutely. it can really damage your company. Right. And so, so especially because some yesterday we had a discussion and somebody said, oh, you must be from Wundercloud and you have all these developers. And <laughs> no, we're actually a small company. And, and if we, get this wrong a few times, it really hurts. So m my point is, if you look at this and you say, okay, we've chosen to do this waterfall because we knew the specs and we, you know, we, we, we kept this uh, constraint, we still weren't able to make a right estimation. And my idea is you cannot estimate the amount of work for a project beforehand. Like never, you cannot do it, cannot be done. 
if you keep this in mind, then it's like we, we're trying, we're doing our best here, and, and you say, well, I think it's a safe choice, like the waterfall safe choice. Mm -hmm. I don't, ag I don't agree. I think it's a risky choice, and it's the more risky choice for both your client and for you. I think the safe choice is agile, and, and small companies should are better off working agile, taking less risk, because right. you cannot estimate beforehand. You just count. Well, yeah, I'm not really sure what's worse: getting into a poorly, a poor relationship on an agile project, or being a little off because you didn't spend enough discovery time. I mean, we ask if if we aren't sure about something. We'll ask for a pre-project of discovery time, where we'll ask for payment to spend all the time hashing these things out. And for some projects where uh, that just seems impossible, that fails my project thing, where it, you just can't clearly define what needs to be done. So we do won't do those projects. This happens right here, where we, where you lose some. And I and I remember, you know, years ago, you, you just you need the work, so you get it in their budget. And you really lose some, and you might win some. But this happens more now, I think, because you get pretty good at estimation, I think, where we've accommodated the client because we think we want to impress them, and we've let them creep scope a little bit, and we've calculated that loss, and that loss is actually viewed as an investment in the relationship. And then sometimes it's easier, and you just win. But right, yeah, when you start out, it's super risky and annoying and frustrating to be put on, to, to need to, to the money to get the job and to, to sign on it and basically because you're hungry you're signing too early. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, so, so, so estimations are important and um, uh, also I like to say that the trust you've, you've mentioned just is very important also the role of the product owner. So something we see that if the, com the, the, the person is uh, uh, not tech savvy for example, or not able to give a no-go decision, they should not be a product owner. Yep. And um, in Holland, we even have companies that say, no, the product owner is something, fr someone from our team. Right. Which is... <laughs> There's a lot of this, like... Uh, interesting thing. The guy from Four Kitchens there. has yeah. been doing a lot of work on what he calls consultancy scrum. Um, and yeah. in, in, the case, in that case, he's got clients coming, and they're already committed to Agile, and they're, they're saying they want to do Agile, and so now there needs to be a develop a way to make them good product owners or good team members so that the whole thing doesn't fall apart mid project. Yeah, look into these guys. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Hi. Um, so to summarize perhaps just one angle of your of your kind of presentation and talk. Um, you're saying that some projects fit the waterfall model because they're well defined. And agile projects are perhaps more risky because the, the scope is not defined. Could you explain why you can't do a well-defined scope project in an agile way? Oh no, you totally can. And so that's why do we need waterfall? Well, no, well <laughs> you, you need to you need to honor and value the process, the uh, the writing of the specifications, and I actually think you should bring that in to the to an agile process. The more spec writing, the better. Absolutely, you so just don't do it all up front, you still have to define the work you're, otherwise how are you going to do the demo at the end of the iteration? How are you going to present what we've done if we didn't know what we were going to do? How do you commit to, to a chunk of work in an iteration if you don't know? Well, I think we still need the waterfall process because there are still clients that need it to some extent. Okay. Where if they're a university and they're a great client and you really want to work with them and they, have, they don't have the time to be on the team, and they have a f they have they have the specs. Absolutely no, that I would totally agree with. So, you know, the, the you were asking earlier who's been on successful agile projects, and that was me. And who's been on bad ones, and that was me. Yeah. And it's not to do with the scope. I I've found in my experience, I've been doing agile projects for about five or six years now, team building. Um, it's to do with the lack of the product owner needs two things. They need to be available, and they need to be able to make decisions. That's it. Yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. You and if you don't have that then you can't do Agile. So, so really what we're saying is some clients can't or don't want to do Agile. Absolutely. And those clients maybe should do Waterfall. Yeah, and when and really what spurs this is... Because they're going to fail anyway, aren't they? Sorry. <laughs> 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 they'll do Waterfall and then they'll fail. Well, you're right. I think what spurs this is I think consultancy are consultancies are overcompensating a little bit and they're getting into these 
uh, projects with clients being agile where they shouldn't. Mm, fair enough. And so this kind of gives a, a formula to those consulting people. I'll try and get the last word. No, <laughs> honestly, I'm not trying to get the last word. But what I was going to say is then, the, then those people just shouldn't do the project. They don't know what they're doing. They're not available to make those decisions. They can't define the scope. Stop it. <laughs> You're wasting money. Oh, well, you know, if, you, if you've got uh, a client that can't define the scope, but they've got enough money and they want to get something like what they want, and it's really critical that they get this particular product out, and you can kind of feel like they're going to be a good team and they pass, you know, they, they make the hurdles and they get to the agile side, we'll, you know, we'll just work hourly for them on sprints, and we'll just work with them. We'll, we'll define the sprint at the beginning and just get it yep. done and, and get them something like what they want. All right, thanks.